everyone and welcome to our very first episode of It's a Start, the podcast where people who aren't experts on anything try to make sense of what is going on in the world. My name is Anna and I am here with the one and only Angus. For as long as you'll have me, yeah. Angus will have you every week. We'll see. <laughs> um, so today we're going to be talking about something that now seems synonymous with humanity and that is plastics. Now, plastics is a super meaty topic and we're never going to get it all covered in just one mini series. And so I'm already thinking, Angus, like we might need to do a couple of plastics. It's, it'll be bits. it'll be a whole series. We'll have to edit it all together. We'll figure it out. Uh, we'll have series within series. Exactly. <laughs> um, so today in particular, we're going to be focusing on a couple of things that zone more in on plastic in the oceans. Firstly, we're going to go back to 2015 and talk about a very emotive video that launched the plastic straw debate into mainstream media. Um, have a little think about it and see if you can remember what one we're talking about. I then can. Angus is going to tell us about where most ocean plastics come from and why, beyond straws getting stuck up turtles' noses, plastics are such a problem. And finally, we're going to round off this episode by talking about why plastics are actually good for some things. Yeah, so... Today we're hoping to get everyone on the same wavelength when it comes to ocean plastics. So, uh, like Anna already very correctly said, we're never going to be able to cover all plastic, even in the ocean, in a single episode. Uh, but we, what we do cover should give you those conversational nuggets of information to bring up. Uh, and will help you just have a more realistic view of where the real problems lie and the damages. Uh, and as always, our full disclosure, uh, Anna and myself are not experts. On the subject or anything most of the time to be honest nothing uh, so <laughs> not a thing so all the information we got today we found it on the internet we did our own research uh we try to use sources that we think are reputable and good but obviously we're going to interpret them a certain way probably and we haven't done this to academic standards so to speak uh, but we have copied and linked all the articles we use in our research so you can have a look where we got our information from Okay, so first we wanted to take you back to 2015 when PhD student Christine Finneger filmed the removal of a plastic straw from the nostril of a sea turtle, which after going viral has led to, sub to the subsequent ban of single-use plastic straws across multiple countries and states. Like, do you remember that video, Angus? I remember it vividly. I don't think I've ever forgotten it since I watched it. <laughs> I, can't, I can't believe it was a far... Like, it was as long as ago as 2015. It, it feels, feels like much more recent. Yeah, I know, but not to like trigger him, but COVID really did mess up my sense of time. Yeah, no, definitely. Like I've, I've lost all track of it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, this, this video was really actually quite sad to watch um, for some people. And I think it actually, it triggered a lot of action, which is a really, really good thing. And the link to the video is in the description box if you haven't seen it. And when I last checked, the video had upwards of 106 million views. Yeah, my tracks. So, I mean, seeing images and videos of animals in distress, suffering, or even dead because of plastic pollution is nothing new. And when I was researching for this, all you have to do is Google, like, literally, quote, plastic on animals, unquote. And there are hundreds and thousands of results. And as an animal, personally, I find that really sad to look at. Mm. There's like images of seals and otters and turtles with things wrapped around their necks, birds with those, you know, those plastic beer rings that you used to get. Actually, you used yeah. to get them. I think they have put changes in place to make sure you don't get them anywhere. But I, yeah, those you must would, see cardboard, but yeah. Yeah, those would be like tethered around sea, sea birds, like their bills, so their beaks. And there's loads of footage of whales and dolphins with plastic found in their stomachs. And there's there's just loads more. Like, there's so many images and videos out there of this. But something different happened with the video of the turtle and the straw. And after the video went viral, there's been a worldwide movement to ban single-use plastic straws. And I, personally, I think what got under people's skin with that video in particular was the really emotive nature of it. It's a long video. It's, well, it's about eight minutes long, actually. So you really mm. go on this like painstaking journey as the people in the video do what they can to remove the straw. And at points, it actually looks like the turtle's crying, which is horrible to watch. Yeah, it's 
kind of brutal. I I know you're saying like we have all those videos of like animals in plastic stuff. I wonder if the same way we got rid of the plastic rings, straws are like I know it makes me aggressively uncomfortable because if I look at a plastic straw now, and I'm not saying this stops me using it entirely, but if like a restaurant gives you a plastic straw, almost immediately I think about that turtle now. Yeah, it was so powerful in creating this like connection between straws are turtle killers. I think that's just yeah. embedded in people's brains. <laughs> no, it's just right in there now. Um, and I think the, the uproar and publicity that was catalyzed by this video actually, I mean, it did. It went on to make some real, real, real changes. Yeah, it was tangible. Sure. It, stuff happened. Um, it was in 2018 when we saw Disney and Starbucks announce that they would be phasing out single-use plastic straws. There's also multiple countries and states across the world who are looking to ban or at least heavily limit the availability of single-use plastic straws, such as the UK for one, China, um, California, the European Union, Washington, and that's just to name but a few. So it definitely touched a nerve. And people in governments thought, like, damn, we need to do something about this. Which is great, because I do completely agree that single-use plastics, such as plastic straws, plastic cutlery, plastic cotton buds, or Q-tips, as you Americans call them. Quality tips, yeah. <laughs> is that what the Q means? It Originally, they used to stand for quality gay tips, and now I believe it's just been shortened to quality tips. Quality tips. Mm-hmm. Anyway cotton buds um, and those single-use plastic things are pretty unnecessary so I think in in all honesty it was great to see that as much as the the turtle suffering in that video was horrible it really did a lot for creating change yeah and I don't I don't think we can play that up enough like getting rid of plastic straws was a good thing yeah definitely yeah 100% um on that note there is a but (laughs) <laughs> and of course, this is my part of the preparation for today's podcast was to find out what this butt was. Um, so while all of this is great and we can all sleep a bit better at night knowing that because you never had a plastic straw in your fizzy drink today, that the ocean <laughs> is a safer place for turtles. <laughs> plastic straws actually only account for less than 1% of all plastic that is in the ocean. Mm. And I mean... I know, that's a moment where you go, oh. But what was really interesting is I don't, I I didn't know that before I did this research and we did a poll Mm. on our Instagram to find out if any of our listeners knew that as well and the majority of people actually answered that they thought it was more than 5% of plastic in the ocean was down to the likes of plastic straws and plastic cutlery and things like that but it's actually less than 1%. Yeah, I mean, I suppose it is just straws, like, I know we use a lot as a society, but it's not the most, it's not a thing I use every day, I think, even in the past. So it's not yeah, out of nowhere, it's, it's but not, it's just a little disappointing yeah. to know we got rid of something and it was it was not the whole game, I guess. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, well, 1% is still a lot of individual straws, like, as yes. you're saying, Angus, like, especially when you consider that England alone, not including Sto- Scotland, Northern Ireland, or Wales, let's be very specific on that, England alone, <laughs> as a Scot, I will be, <laughs> I'll stand up for that. <laughs> England alone uses roughly 4.8 billion plastic straws a year, and this was, of course, before the ban. And in the USA, it's estimated that there are about 500 million straws used daily. So 1% of this number of straws is a lot of straws. Like, let's not forget that. It's a lot. Mm -hmm. But the point remains, like, why are we making a huge fuss over the success of the plastic straw ban if plastic straws only account for less than 1% of waste in our oceans. And at the risk of sounding like I'm pro-turtle suffering, the video... <laughs> <laughs> Is that a thing? I am Turtle. not pro, pro-turtle suffering, not at all. But the video of the turtle with the straw up its nose also looked like it could have been a very rare thing to happen. Like, logistically... It just looks like something that might not happen every time a turtle and a straw come into contact with each other. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it did kind of... I was surprised to see how far up its nose it's gone. I, it was a strange... Brutal. Again, we're glad they're gone, but it was a very... It's felt strange. Yeah, I, I want to know the backstory. How did that happen? But, I mean, with this one turtle with the one plastic straw up its nose, it's good to know as well that... There's around 1 million marine birds and animals that die each year because of other plastic pollution problems. So this plastic straw in the nostril issue may have been 
I don't want to say quite niche, but you know, there's lots other there's lots of other things going on around there. Yeah. So if plastic straws account for less than one percent of ocean plastics, what makes up for the rest of the plastic weight pol- that pollutes the oceans every year? After all, there are roughly about ten million tons of plastic finding their way into the oceans each year. Yes. So this is my part where I get to be the a, a bit doom and gloom. Uh, at the very least, give everyone the numbers. Woohoo! Uh, so, <laughs> Anna, you're entirely right. It's it's about ten. So I think I kept finding the numbers between eight and fourteen. Uh, it is hard to measure this, I will say, because obviously it's like you can't exactly go wrong the ocean and just kind of count it with a with like one of those stopwatch looking things the way you would most other problems. Yeah, I read, I don't know if you read this, Angus, but that most plastic actually sinks. There's like a tiny percentage yes. of plastic that floats. So like you're saying, it's so hard to measure because a lot of it you actually might not even see. Yeah, well, I mean, if anyone wants to think about that, if you feel like a, if everyone used those disposable little plastic cups you have like mm. at parties or at cl- or just anywhere, if you fill one with water, it's not going to float. Yeah. So it's unsurprising this all ends up in the seabed. But uh, to start, so we'll say eight to fourteen million tons get into the ocean each year. That's on how much is in there currently. That's every year we're adding that amount. Mm. Uh, and additionally, this isn't all necessarily in the ocean, but eighty percent of plastic ever created is still around. Uh, wow. we've recycled 9%, which we love, we'd love for that number to grow. Uh, and we've burned 12%. Wow. So the rest we've... is just around. Still around. Yes. So now, not all of it, uh, is in the ocean. A lot of that is in landfills, uh, and kind of sitting in a space. Mm. Uh, but it is still here. We've not gotten good at actually recycling that much. Uh, additionally, 80%, again, 80%. Of all ocean trash is plastic. So the vast majority of trash that ends up in the ocean that we kind of have to worry about is plastic. This is the big problem. Yeah. Uh, And I'm sure everyone's heard about, you know, like the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. It's that huge floating thing. It's between Hawaii and California. I heard of this recently. Yes. uh, It is three times the size of France. Wow. Wow. I mean, you it, don't need to know much about the size of France to know that if you saw it on a map and then pictured three of those, yeah, that's pretty big. It's pretty, it's huge. That's kind of the problem. Uh, so that's how much plastic is around in, in the ocean. And as I think I've made, I think the data speaks for itself. It's a lot. It is an awful yeah. lot of plastic. Um, but it's also fair to work out like what plastic exactly is ending up in the ocean. Because like we said, plastic straws... Billions are made, hundreds of millions are used every day in the States, but it's less than 1% of that is in the ocean, which is what we're really focusing on today. So I found a Forbes article that tried to break down the top four uh, sources of plastic in the ocean. Yeah. Um, again, we've linked this if you want to have a look for yourself. Uh, so according to this article, the top four were plastic bags, so single-use plastic bags at 14%. Wow. Plastic bottles at 12%. Uh, food containers and cutlery at 9%, which I have a sneaking suspicion that might include straws. Yeah, that makes me, yeah. Those sort of like consumable things. Yes, uh, that might con- include straws. And then 9% is wrappers. So like on your okay. Snickers bar or something. Yeah, uh-huh, yeah. Um, And I don't want to keep making this about hurdles but it's a fair to point out a big problem with plastic bags in the ocean uh is that turtles eat them a lot of them do so for instance uh loggerhead turtles eat jellyfish that's like a big part of their diet they i think they almost exclusively eat invertebrates like they don't eat anything with bones oh wow and uh loggerheads according to a study 17 percent of the time they encounter a plastic bag they'll eat it Oh, because it looks, of course, it if looks, it's floating around the ocean, yeah, it looks like a jellyfish. Plastic, I guess not, it looks a lot like a jellyfish. Oh, now, no. as we said, a lot of that plastic ends up on the ocean floor, though, which is where a bigger problem shows it, which is green turtles, which are like, I'm pretty sure those are the classic like sea turtles that you see all over the place. Yeah, the ones that you saw in Finding Nemo. There you go. Are they, are they green turtles? I think they, they might be loggerheads, be. but anyways. Uh, <laughs> Great sea turtles, green turtles, uh, they hunt for algae. They eat a lot of just like uh, growth on the ocean floor. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. which again, if a plastic bag is kind of stuck to a rock and it's just floating a little bit, it looks Mm. like algae to them. Uh, And they will eat a plastic bag 62% of the time they come across it. Wow. So So actually now plastic bags are essentially making up a large part of their diet unintentionally. Yeah, it's, I don't know if that's 60% of what they eat, but it means that more often than not, if a, if a green turtle sees a plastic bag, it's going to end up eating it, which is obviously not great. Yeah. Uh, now, this is just the breakdown, and obviously, that sucks. I think we can all pretty disagree. That's not great. Yeah, I mean, nobody uh, wants that at all. Yeah, but I, I'll be honest, I don't think we have to tell people listening hey, pl- single-use plastic bags are bad. Not at all. Because I, th- I think most, even stores these days, they'll still sell them to you, but they started adding a price. Uh, and I know Tesco, they don't call them like a plastic, they call them a for-life bag. Or they Oh, yeah, bags for life. Bags for life. They've, they've, I can at least appreciate the idea of like, we're trying to get people to, if you get one of these, bring it back. Like, don't yeah. throw it away. Yeah, I think as a society, we have definitely moved over to knowing that single-use plastics are bad and it perhaps feels like at the minute though that they are unavoidable yes so we're I, at least people seem aware of that now a big part of the problem though in terms of immediately killing marine life and causing the environmental issues we're worried about is actually a lot more industrial mm-hmm. so listen we're not going to downplay the plastic bags the bottles the food containers the wrappers but in general a seal, for instance, can kind of swim through some wrappers and some food containers and be fine. Yeah. We don't love the sea turtles eating them, but like creatures in the ocean can kind of move past those things. Unfortunately, though, there are two huge uh, chunks of waste and plastic in the ocean that are a real problem. One is fishing gear, mm-hmm. uh, which includes everything from like a big part of its nets, but it's also old fishing lines, hooks. Uh, everything like that. I believe it's a, I believe it's pushing eight to ten percent uh, in my research of all ocean plastic was along this. Okay. <clears throat> uh, and it's called to it's actually referred to when it's been abandoned and a lot of it is abandoned. The bigger problem isn't really actively used gear because normally, I think we've all seen videos. There's like a very funny video of people fishing. They scoop up their trawling net, dump out the fish. And there's like a massive walrus or seal in the net. Yeah, it's not stuck. It just kind of plunks out onto the boat. Up. Yeah, yeah, and then just looks around <laughs> and then goes back in the sea and disappears. Yeah, because if you're using the equipment, you can at least monitor. Like, hey, we're not fishing for seals. Yes, you can the at pr- least release them back. Yeah. Yes, the problem is that fishing, uh, a lot of like the big fishing operations, end up leaving behind and dumping nets. Mm. Uh. I'm not 100% sure why they, I think I saw somewhere it's if they're damaged or they deem them like no longer viable. They don't bring them back. They just kind of cut them loose. Yeah. Uh, that is referred to as ghost gear. Uh, I'm going to get into what that does a lot more, but ghost gear is bad. Uh, we'll go into the impacts of ghost gear. And there's another thing, which is industrial plastics. It's a fun word. Again, I'll talk about this more after I break down how it gets into the ocean a little more, like what it actually does. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they're called nurdles. Ner- nurdles. Which is That's a- better than an American accent. It made nurdles. It- n- nurdles. Yeah, nurdles. <laughs> uh, hilarious word. But what they essentially are is they're tiny little beads of plastic. They're actually, uh, like, I'll get into what a microplastic is in a second. Yeah. Uh, they, if you've heard the term microplastic, these things are tiny little beads. Uh, they're already microplastics in production. And they're essentially the thing that you melt to make everything else. Ah, okay, so So that's almost the thing before the thing you make. Yes, so before it's a bottle or a fork or uh, anything of the sort, you get a shipment of nurdles, which are these little beads that you can melt and then turn into the shape you want them to be. Ah, interesting. Uh, Yeah, that's a little fun fact for everyone. Uh, But nurdles make up a huge environmental problem. I don't think by weight they're a huge issue, but they exist already as microplastics. Yeah, okay. Which, in a second, I'll explain why that's so terrible. But I want to really quickly cover, that's the makeup of it. So most of our plastic is individual consumer used. Most of the mass of it is stuff we all use. Mm -hmm. But some of the most 
damaging things, the stuff that really harms sea life is industrial use. And there's a lot of that kicking around the ocean. Okay. Um, now, as I so for industrial use plastics, generally it ends up there either by dumping illegally, such as ghost gear. Uh, yeah, or... this ghost this ghost gear thing really interests me because I had never yes. heard of ghost gear, and also in our poll, um, the majority I think one person out of the yeah. entire vote knew what ghost gear meant. It's something I've never ever heard of. Yeah, so ghost gear, it's just all that fishing gear that gets left behind is just referred to as ghost gear because it's just dead and sitting on the ocean floor and kind of floating along. Wow. Uh, okay. But most of our waste or our plastic waste that ends up in the ocean 80 percent of it comes from land so the vast majority of what we're dumping in the ocean basically it's either sitting in a landfill or it's being illegally dumped uh, but a lot of it ends up in rivers that feed into the ocean mm, okay so there's there's less well it's still a huge problem of directly dumping the ocean but it's not so much that there's a landfill by the sea that's just leaking in but it's there by rivers and things uh that end up uh one of the articles i've listed uh you can look this you can look through our thing uh it has a very good breakdown of which rivers uh are the biggest problems uh we're not going to go into all that right now but i do want to get rid of a myth i don't know if anyone's heard this but i think me and anna both came across some, like we saw a video of a guy saying like nine nine rivers in the world are responsible for 90 percent of the waste oh yeah i know this guy i was not yeah, so, i was not pleased when i saw this guy's video no it wasn't the most <laughs> a convincing piece of information. But I was really fascinated by this because I think everyone can home at least hear the number. Nine rivers, 90% of the waste. If you figure out how to filter out those nine rivers, you've solved most of the problem. Yeah, that's a really good point. That's huge. That would be huge. Unfortunately, it's also, uh, we might believe this, it's bullshit. It's totally <laughs> fake. So that's not, wait, so it's not that nine rivers are feeding... No. 90% of the world's ocean plastic problem. That is no. not true. That is not true. Oh, false. okay. So completely false. So that nine rivers number was based on a study done in 2017. Uh, and again, they don't actually, all these studies that try to calculate dumping, they don't do it by counting the waste or like having someone to monitor the amount. It's basically, it's math. They're trying to predict... Uh, with variables, how this dumping works. Okay. So the nine rivers that were claimed to dump 90% of the plastics were huge rivers by massive population centers in areas with minimal uh, supervision on things like dumping. Okay. Or at the very least, just huge rivers. So for instance, the Yangtze River in China, which is one of the biggest rivers in the world, mm -hmm. was one of those nine rivers. And purely just because... With the mathematical like, equation, yeah, it was if near you, a large population, yeah. and it was more likely that these areas had less strict rules on yeah. dumping. So they said, with our calculation, this probably makes up a huge number. Nine rivers, all the big ones, like it's the Nile, uh, the Ganges in India, Yangtze. It's basically the biggest rivers they thought would have the most dumping. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, a more recent uh, study done in 2021, which used way more variables, they tried to get a lot more clarity on the issue, found that of the top 10 rivers that dump, it's 18%. So of the top 10 rivers that dump plastic, or that are seen to contribute yes. to the ocean plastic problem, mm -hmm. only contribute to how many percent? 18. 18% of the, the world's oceans of that problem. Of that 80% of... I know we're saying a lot of statistics, so we're going to... Of the 80% that comes from the land... Yes. 18% of that ends up in the ocean by these 10... By 10 rivers. Okay, that makes sense. Because in the video that we had watched, the person basically says that the world's ocean plastic problem is down to developing countries, pretty yes. much. So that is... It's kind of been myth-busted then. Kind of been myth-busted. Also, I think it's... A little unfair to claim certain countries are totally responsible. We can, the historical and economic factors that can force countries into certain practices and how they got there is a whole box of worms to unpack. Uh, but if you wanted to hit that same number of 90% of dumping from rivers into the ocean, mm -hmm. uh, you'd have to, to hit 90%, that's across 1,600 rivers. 
Wow, which is so a lot, a lot more it's rivers. A, than it's a great deal are. more. So it's not as easy as you set up ten good nets across nine rivers and go right, job done. <laughs> We've saved the world. We've sorted ten rivers with nets. Yeah, it's so it's fair to point. This is a harder issue to cover than just hey, you fixed nine rivers. That's where all the plastics getting in from were sorted. Yeah, it's good to. It is, good and helpful to know actually even from my point of view that this is a quite an evenly spread problem and it cannot yeah. seem to be pinpointed geographically on whose fault it is and why yeah it's not that simple unfortunately um that is how so from that's basically how a lot of it gets into the ocean um now we know what it is so it's a lot it's a absolute metric tons and tons of all these different plastics a lot of it's coming from land and landfills and getting in by rivers. Um, now, what plastic actually does might be a little unclear. Um, because I know we all saw, like I said, the, we're going to keep talking about sea turtles the whole time, I think. I know. We'll need to start uh, a group. Save the turtles. Have, save the turtles. <laughs> so we know about, I brought up turtles eat plastic bags, which is obviously bad. Straws get stuck up noses. Obviously bad. Um... I think you said a million animals every year die from plastics. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, I read that yeah, around yeah. a million animals each year are dying because of plastic issues. So, if you remember ghost gear, which I talked about earlier, uh, I said it only it doesn't make up the majority of plastics. It's I think mm -hmm. I said it's around ten percent was the number I found, something like that. Mm -hmm. Of that million, if ten percent of all plastic is ghost gear, and there's a million animals dying from plastic. Yep. 650,000 sea animals are killed or injured by ghost gear and fishing equipment uh, wow. improperly every So year. most of those deaths of marine life can be linked more closely to the ghost gear yeah. than, you know, there's more animals dying because of the ghost gear rather than our straws, plastic forks, yes. plastic spoons, 100%. and plastic bags and things like that. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Right. So, so we we were flying the flag, thinking, amazing, we've banned plastic straws. But the problem, if, if yeah. animals suffering is your problem, then ghost gear is actually a big issue. Ghost gear might be the biggest thing of immediate like animal suffering because it's not it's not abstract. Like I'm gonna microplastics are a whole thing. I'm gonna talk about in just a second. I know I've said that a few times, <laughs> but of like immediate like this kills animals immediately like this gets them right away it's ghost wow. gear do you know how so a lot of it is it just they get trapped oh so yeah. for instance seals and sharks uh sharks have to keep moving to breathe that's how their gills work mostly oh, okay if they get stuck in a net they can't continue to swim so they oh, can't man. breathe wow and seals i mean either they get stuck underwater and Seals are mammals. They have to breathe air. Uh, and then they die that way. Or if you get stuck, you can't hunt and search for food. So, you know, it's, it's honestly, I don't recommend people look this up. You can, you can find a million images of animals trapped in ghost gear. Uh, it's, it's just not, it's not a fun thing to look at. Yeah, uh, that sounds sad. I actually have an issue with the term ghost gear as well. Because ghost mm -hmm. is almost like, people are just getting rid of their responsibility of it and then taking no ownership over it. Like the term ghost, it's yeah. like it belongs to no one. If you look at it literally, I mean ghosts. It's you just, can't it's, see it's, them. It's haunt I, was, I mean, it's haunting the oceans. I think that's yeah. the whole thing. It's, oh, wow. A spooky episode coming uh, soon. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is, this is all kind of harrowing. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone's in a breakdown of if there's a particular group that dumps most of its plastic... Uh, waste and thing like all their fishing gear mm. i think it's a pretty from what i've read it seems to be a pretty industry-wide problem yeah it, so would, I, it would be interesting to know that but it it figures like you're on a boat you're out in the middle of the ocean nobody's around to watch you what incentive do you have to bring back your broken nets lines yeah. hooks it's easy nobody's watching you to just chuck it overboard and out of sight out of mind yeah uh and whatever the solution that is, it's a little beyond me at this time, but we're 
we'll try to come up with some things you can do at home in our part three, as we always do, or always try to. Uh, but Ghost Gear is an industry problem. Now, Nerdles. Nerdles. Uh, Nerdles the are going to be... Woo-hoo. The word Nerdles. They're going to be <laughs> on my introduction for everyone to microplastics. Because microplastic is this big, scary word that I have seen a thousand times in a thousand places. Yeah. Like, yeah, everyone keeps going, microplastics are ending up in uh, our food chain. Microplastics are doing this, microplastics are doing that. Yeah, apparently we eat microplastics oh, without 100%. even knowing it. Yes, for sure. But what is a microplastic? So microplastic, strictly, the definition is just plastic that is smaller than five millimeters. So literally microscopic plastic. Literally <laughs> microplastic. So nurdles, like I said, they're in production when they're made are shorter than five millimeters. So they are created as a microplastic. Okay. Um, now, a lot of the real problem is that these plastics break down and become too small to like see with the naked eye. Yeah. So then they end up in fish, which... They basically screw up the whole food chain. So the thing about microplastics is we're not 100% sure of everything they're going to do yet. Uh, Mm. Because I think the scientific community is pretty on board that things shouldn't be eating plastic and having it in your body is bad. Yes. I heard that. We can can all agree. We can all get behind that. to eat is not good. Yes. Because so, the whole point on that, through my research, is that plastic actually releases a lot of toxins. So if you're consuming these plastics, those toxins are going to be released into your body. Yeah. Um, now, there's all kinds of studies about how it... Uh, a real problem is, uh, I think it's zooplankton, is the word for them. They're like the, the base layer of the food chain of the ocean. Like tiny creatures, they just like consume small things. Uh, they end up eating microplastics sometimes die and then that can mess up the whole food chain uh because your base layer is gone there's also a study uh to spook the fellas out there apparently ending up with microplastics in your body can has apparently mildly been linked to male infertility no way really apparently this uh, is early days well a big you will see this a lot everyone is very hesitant to say what microplastics are going to do because they are very new to us we're okay, just, we just don't know enough. We just yeah. kind of caught them as a thing and are really starting to get it together. Um, but you were talking about toxins. So I'm going to give us a little case study right now. Oh, uh, case I found, studies I of a, Angus. Let's go. It was a great, I found a great Guardian article that broke down. Uh, it was an express uh, shipping container sank near Sri Lanka in 2021, in May of 2021. Okay. Um, now, on this boat... Uh, I don't believe they were moving <clears throat> a great deal of uh, oil or fuel. At least that's not what the article focused on. Um, the real problem, besides, like there was oil and fuel, obviously, that leaked because it's a boat, and that was terrible. A huge problem was the shipment was carrying nurdles. Okay. Uh, it was a boat that was transporting plastics. And in the uh, sinking of the express... Uh, 1,680 tons of nurdles got into the ocean. Okay, so 1,680 tons of these tiny, tiny little plastic balls. Yep, little, little like, four millimeter wide balls gone to the ocean. Okay, it's a lot. Now, that's a lot. Now, the UN called the Express Pearl Incident. I believe it was the Express Pearl was the name of the full boat. The Express Pearl Incident is the worst maritime disaster to have struck Sri Lanka. Wow. Okay. That is the first word of, that's the first line of the summary of their report. Wow. The worst. And the worst. And the reason for this is because what nurdles, what all plastic does is chemicals in the water that we, that humans put there, which we'll probably talk about again in another series, <laughs> such as oil uh, and other toxins, stick to plastics. Okay. They don't mix with water particularly, but they will stick to plastics like nothing else. Uh-huh. And the thing about nurdles is that they look, they are confused for food by a lot of fish. Oh, wow. Okay. So you're saying so, things get stuck. So you've potentially got yeah. balls of nurdles at the center with like oil, fuels, other yeah. bad things stuck around All it. All stuck around it. Animals then eat them and die of poisoning. Uh, hmm. Nurdles are... Uh, they are a 
beginning microplastics, so they're going to break down super flat, fast even to more microplastics, which are going to kill more small marine life. Yeah. And at their base, when they end up in the ocean, they can be eaten by fish mistaken for food, which then kills them because they're probably coated in chemicals from whatever spill happened. Wow. Okay. So this was a big problem. This has this, this is, is a, like a ricochet yes. effect. This is a ricochet effect, and it's fair to note, nurdles, despite being this dangerous, like clearly we don't want them in the oceans. Yeah. Do not require any special handling or treatment. Currently. Okay. So you know, like when an oil tanker or something ship ships, as I was happy to learn, I think we all kind of hoped intrinsically. There's rules you have to follow. You can't just move it the way you would some Xboxes in a shipping container. <laughs> okay, you have to do some specialized stuff then to yeah, move you around have to your do, fuel. It's like a certain kind of boat with certain specifications to like, and you have to do it in a certain way. So, you know, if and when there's a spill, it's mitigated. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> Makes sense. I'm glad to know that. <clears throat> yeah, it's it's nice to know that it's there are rules for that kind of stuff. Nerdles have no such rules. Hmm. So a current problem is that there's no requirement to treat nurdles as like a hazardous substance when, as the UN clearly seems to agree with, if they end up in the ocean in large quantities, it's a real problem. Yeah, because it was the UN that said in the report that yes, this is the worst this is, maritime disaster. I'm not quoting disaster. the Guardian article on that one. I'm quoting the UN report on the Express Pearl incident. So if the UN know it's so bad, why aren't there these extra regulations when it comes to their moving and handling? I mean, I think we're only beginning. This is, I'll say, this is a little bit of speculation at this point. Yeah. Uh, I think we're only beginning to understand how bad plastics are, especially microplastics. Uh, so I think it's just the way that legislation and government moves slowly that's yeah. kind of part of its nature i imagine legislation is going to be discussed in the near future mm -hmm. considering this incident happened in 2021 like this was very recently yeah, yeah less than very, a year ago yeah mm -hmm. and um, when actually when you look at legislation it was 2015 that the sea turtle video came out 2018 people really started talking about it and in england it was 2020 2021 when the ban mm -hmm. was put in place so, so it takes case time. in point it takes time i really hope something happens but i think we're just getting to grip with how bad this is um but yeah that is i know this is all supposed to be talking about plastics and the issues that's most of what i found i know it was a lot i know <laughs> there's a lot of bad news but just so everyone just like quickly summarize the rant I went on for 20 minutes or whatever it feels like. <laughs> uh, 8 to 14 tons of plastic in the ocean. 80% comes from land. A lot of that ends up from rivers. If it's big plastic, it chokes out animals and kills them that way. If it's little plastic, it poisons them and kills the small animals, which then mean that the big animals can't eat anything and starve. That's plastics. Wow. Wow. Do you know, this is meant to be a super upbeat podcast, but don't worry. We will get is. to the upbeat part. We we'll get to the upbeat point. We just have to, like, it's just good to know these things because when you say plastics, everybody just goes, yeah, plastics are really bad. But it's so good to know, actually, right, okay, we know they're bad. Why are they bad? And it's good to dig a little bit deeper. So hopefully that has helped because it certainly, certainly helped me. Yeah. So now... <laughs> to bring the positivity, I am <laughs> I'm going to talk about why actually plastic is good and it's needed for a lot of things. We cannot yes. just, after hearing Angus's um, information there, it would be really easy to say, right, stop all production of plastic. It's terrible. We don't need it. It's killing everybody. Might, may well kill humans soon. So who knows? If we'd eaten these fish that are eating the microplastics and the microplastics have had bad chemicals stuck to them. Who knows? As Angus said, we just don't know enough about it yet. But it's super easy to go, okay, cancel plastics. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is when cancel culture should come into play. <laughs> I mean, I'd love to see it. Uh, but, but you're right, we can't, yeah, go on to your point about how we can't just get rid of plastic because it we, sucks that we can't. But We absolutely cannot just get rid of them. So basically it was after the Second World War that the mass manufacturing of plastics like really took off. So like when the war ended, all of these American manufacturers needed to find themselves a new market because plastic produce were being used to help mm -hmm. the Second World War effort. Um, 
And basically, all these American companies had all these factories set up, and when the war was ended, they didn't have anything to do with them. So American manufacturers started to respond to the demand for high volumes of goods at lower costs. And that's basically the answer that plastics provided. You can create a lot of goods at low cost and you can sell them for cheap. And that's what the baby boomers of post-war era wanted. They wanted more things and they wanted them cheaply. And, well, it was actually after this, um, it was actually around the 1960s that the single-use plastic straw started to be mass-produced because it was better and cheaper than the plastic tubes, as they were called, that came beforehand. And, yeah, you did hear right, like, some people moan a bit about paper straws now, but we had them before. Oh, so it was was paper tubes before. It was paper tubes. And then okay. the war happened, and then we realized that we could make lots of plastic for cheap, and it was actually mm-hmm. better at doing some stuff. So we started making plastic straws because it was cheaper and better, because you didn't get your paper that went soggy at the bottom and things like that. And we actually asked our listeners if they bothered, if they'd mind using paper straws. And luckily, the majority of us don't use, don't mind using plastic straws. So yeah, I know. A, I've never been, I know the whole, I know the whole thing is like they melt a little bit. I don't know, they go a bit faster. mushy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they go a little bit mushy. Just order another one. Or don't use a straw at all. There you are. Yeah, just, that's fine. <laughs> so basically, since then, plastic has gotten everywhere. And if you look around you right now, maybe in your house or your office, you'll easily be able to list off 10 things that contain plastic. I mean, my laptop, the leggings that I'm wearing, the table I'm sitting at, the toilet. Even the, <laughs> I mean, it is. Even yeah. my reusable water bottle that I'm sitting here with right now, it was made from plastic. If you're outside on a walk, maybe there'll be, a, like, there'll definitely be plastic there too. So, I mean, your jacket, cars that are driving past you, a park mm-hmm. bench. I bet you've also passed at least one piece of plastic litter on your journey. That is a personal problem for me, as I hate seeing litter. But the reality Mm -hmm. is it's everywhere. I mean, plastic surrounds us. And we couldn't have got to where we are right now without it. So, like I said, we demonise plastic all the time. But it's not that bad. I mean, the medical industry, for one, is so dependent on plastic for making sure sure that things are sterile and safe for us to use. And that's one industry where reusing things isn't necessarily the best idea. I don't think anyone would want (laughs) a reused needle for bloods (laughs) Mm. just to reduce plastic waste. So we have to admit that plastic has been really good for medical advancements. And we use plastic in our home for insulation, which makes them more energy energy efficient. Sorry. And we're going to need more of the stuff so that our homes keep the heat for longer and we use less energy to heat them up all the time. And that's an agenda with climate change overall, is how do we make our homes more energy efficient so we aren't burning Mm -hmm. energy, heating them up all the time. So great. Plastic, brilliant at that stuff. And I don't know if you've heard this, Angus, but like a thing we often hear from like older generations, parents, grandparents... Is talking about when their milk was delivered in a glass bottle and they'd put the empty glass bottle back out in the doorstep for the milkman to collect it, wash it oh, out, yeah. and then they would fill it up and then they would all get reused again. Listen, I'll say not only did my parents make that argument, I bought into it. There was a very long time where I was ravening on about how I want milkmen to be a job again for this exact reason. <laughs> we need milkmen. Bring back the milkmen. We need I mean, bring back the milkmen. Do you know what? Brilliant. It sounds almost idyllic when we think about how full our bins are now of plastic containers mm-hmm. every week. But really, glass isn't that brilliant either. So, you know, that's what we're saying. One thing, everyone moans about plastic. Oh, why don't we just switch back to glass again for things like drinking containers and and various things like that. But glass actually isn't brilliant for everything. So glass, for one thing, is really heavy. And I mean, you don't need to be a scientist to know that. (laughs) So (laughs) when you say that maybe one truck can carry like a thousand plastic cartons of milk, it would maybe only be able to carry about 500 glass bottles of milk, meaning that it would have to do twice as many journeys and that there would be a whole host of carbon emissions associated with the extra transportation needed to get the milk from A to B. Now, that's not exact maths. Like, I don't know if it would only be 500 bottles in the one truck, but (laughs) you get get the idea. (laughs) Also, glass breaks really easily, so you would risk losing product at a much higher rate, which would lead to more waste. So off Mm -hmm. those glass bottles of milk, you might break 10 of them and then you've just lost that resource and you've lost all the resources that was put in to make that 
carton of milk. Yeah. And dairy well, in its own, in the environment is a whole thing. Yeah. So wasting yeah, dairy. Totally. Wasting dairy is not a good thing. Wasting anything is not a good thing. Yeah. Um, also, to make glass, you need sand, okay? And sure. believe it or not, but we're actually using sand at a rate faster than the planet can replenish it. Look at your really? face, I guess. I know. I know what you're thinking. Like, I sand. feel like we have a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like there's so much sand. There's deserts full of sand. Um, I didn't know this, but you actually need a specific type of sand to make glass. And unfortunately, that does not include desert sand. Ah. It's actually mostly okay. riverbed and seabed sand that is, is used for glass production. And if you okay. think about it, if you're digging up the seabed, that contributes to yeah. coastal erosion. And that's not a good thing in itself anyway. You might have heard that in the news, but we might cover that a wee bit more in some future episodes. But basically, digging up sand from riverbeds and seabeds isn't really great. No, doesn't sound it. Um, but a good thing. Glass is good for something. Okay. Glass sure. is good in the sense that you can keep recycling it and reusing it forever. So, like, glass has mm-hmm. no expiration date to the amount of times you can recycle it. Like, you might have heard that plastic can only be recycled a couple of times before the compounds, so the nerdles that make up yeah. the plastic, are too broken to keep recycling them, so it has to go to landfill. Glass doesn't have that limitation on it. You can just keep recycling and keep recycling. So, once a okay. glass thing is made that glass can remain in the the product chain as long as it's recycled properly forever but glass doesn't get recycled as often as it could because basically people us me you we don't do it Mm. right so it turns out you have to separate the colors really specifically before you can recycle the glass properly Oh. that's that's why you have i don't know if you have these in america angus but here we have like brown glass bins clear glass bins yeah so green glass bins when i when i lived in the uk i did have i think actually did we have separate i think our like the one that they wheeled away from our house was just glass yeah uh-huh uh i know actually i'll for anyone who's in the uk in the states at least i just have a recycling bin oh so you mix all your recycling i fully plastic cardboard glass all oh, in the same Lord. bin and then it gets wheeled away that's a headache that is a headache <laughs> in itself. <laughs> you can't do Anyways. that in the UK. They don't collect your bins if you put the wrong oh, I things know. in the wrong bins. Disaster. I know. <laughs> but did, so we'll get back on track. Don't worry. Oh, so yeah. <laughs> actually, like, so that's great for glass bottles that are certain colours, but you can't actually recycle things like window glass. So all your windows oh. and all your houses, all that glass. Think of all the windows in the world. You can't recycle mm-hmm. that glass. And also Pyrex. So Pyrex is a type of glass that you might see on like cooking dishes. So if you've got like a casserole dish. I was going to say like a pie dish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That can be put in the oven at like really high temperatures and it's Mm -hmm. like kind of reinforced. But basically you can't recycle that type of glass. Is there, by any chance, do you know why you can't recycle that kind of glass? It's because of the special coatings that they use to reinforce it. So obviously, yeah, like your windows in your house are much more resistant to smashing than things like a glass bottle. Yes, got it. So it's all about the extra chemicals and stuff that they put in the the components that make up the glass that mean that you just can't recycle it at all. So it just has to go to landfill. And when glass does make its way to landfill, which it often does, it can mm-hmm. take this was this blew me away. I was like, first of all, how do we know this? It can take <laughs> one million years to decompose. I feel like I remember that fact from like school science class. Really? The fact that I think we I don't think it was that soon, but that is a long time. It's a just long a glass, time. A Coke bottle to be sitting around. Yeah, yeah. So all that glass from all the houses, mm-hmm. all the window glass, is still here. You know, much like the plastic. I mean in comparison to a plastic bottle, which takes about 500 years to decompose, but I mean, then you also have to remember that plastic releases I know, then toxic part chemicals. Part of the decomposition is it turns into microplastics and yeah. such. Which so, is... I mean, there's that whole issue, but plas- a glass, sorry, will be here for a million yeah. years. Before it's it not an easy silver bullet of yeah. let's use uh-huh. glass and we're sorted. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, like, I think I've slagged glass enough. <laughs> and it actually doesn't deserve to be slandered because glass is really good too it's not good for everything because it's not as versatile as plastic mm. 
But the point is that sometimes alternative to plastics aren't always as straightforward as they initially seem. And it's yeah. really easy to think that companies just use plastic because it's cheaper. But as we talked about earlier, it's really good for other things too. Like we know plastic is lighter, so it means you can make things more durable without adding weight to it. Mm -hmm. Also, if you look at things like food, if we didn't wrap some foods in plastic, they would expire much faster. And then that would lead to higher food waste. And seeing as food waste is a leading cause of climate change, more food waste would be bad and probably exceed the figurative savings to the environment yeah. made from cutting out the plastic. Do you know what I mean? Yes, 100%. Like the water that's gone into growing the apples and everything that, yeah, 100%. Yeah. So it's not a case of just saying, okay, we'll never wrap any food in plastic again, because then you will likely have higher rates of food waste. And that's mm -hmm. just not good either. So the conclusion that many articles, articles come to and that I think we're probably coming to as well at the end of this discussion is that we need plastic, but what we don't want is plastic waste. Yes, and 100%. There are, yeah, like I think that's the thing. We accept that we need plastic and it's really good for a whole host of things, but how we get rid of it is a huge problem that I think we're actually just scratching the surface of right now because... Plastic has only really been mass produced since like the 1950s. Yeah, you said like just post World War II, which yeah. is very modern history. In yeah, this definitely. Of it's not that long. So, as you were saying, Angus, like I don't think we know the extent of the damage that things like microplastics are doing right now. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there are definitely plastics that we can think twice about. So, things like straws, um, disposable yeah. cu cutlery, some plastic wrapped food. But there are also some plastics that we just can't live without, such as the ones used in medical settings and mm -hmm. things that actually do just make our lives and things better and easier to use. Yeah. So what it's... we need to start... Yeah, on you go. No, I was just going to say, it feels like we've basically, we've cracked how to make it. We've cracked how to distribute it and shape it. Mm -hmm. We're very bad at the last step, which should be, what do you do with it at the end of its life cycle? Totally. Absolutely. We need to sort out what happens at the end? And I think for so long, companies were just not thinking about that last step. Mm -hmm. And yeah, well, I mean, you know, it, it's it's a new thought process, I think, in our civilization to be like, what do you do with the thing after you're done using it? Yeah, definitely. It's something that we seem to nowadays just be getting our head around is actually, okay, that thing came from somewhere and now it has to go away again. So where is it yeah. going when it goes away? And we're just seeing these things bubbling up to the surface now in the past couple, mm -hmm. even 10 to 15 years. Yeah, for sure. Well, today's episode run on a little long, I think you know what people say, but plastic <laughs> just is a, a huge bit. topic. Just a little bit. Uh, and we want to really quickly, once again, thank you so much for listening. Today, I think we've done a really good job. We have covered how much plastic is getting into the ocean, 8 to 14 million tons. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that a thousand, uh, sorry, not a thousand, a million uh, sea animals are dying every year from plastic in the oceans. Uh, we walked through how is it getting there, like through rivers and landfills, uh, what the real danger is in ghost gear trapping animals and microplastics killing small uh, sea life and then dis disrupting the food chain. Uh, Anna then brought us right back to the unfortunate but kind of fortunate truth that plastics aren't inherently evil. It's not the same as like we really need to cut it out with the whole fossil fuels thing. Yep. Like in the long term. Like it seems like plastics don't need to forever disappear. The no, same way not we need at all. To... No, no, no. So... Uh, plastic only forever disappear, which means it is a complex issue. Uh, and we hope that, like, through that summer, you've learned a little bit today. So there we have it, guys. And I mean, as always, we love to hear your comments and feedback, reactions, whether you agree or disagree. Also, if Angus or I got anything wrong, please let us please know. Please let us know. Yeah, because... absolutely. Hit us up. Let us know. <laughs> Because as they said at the start of this, we are absolutely not experts on this subject matter. We've just done a little bit of digging to try and present to you some facts and pieces of information that you might not have known about beforehand. Yeah. Uh, but to that end, uh, we'd love it if you joined us for part two of this little series where we are getting on. We're very excited to have him on. Uh, we are getting on Bob Twos, who is an absolute wicked smart man. Uh, and a total an legend. <laughs> a total legend uh i will say we do we have both met bob before we both talked to him uh he is an expert in things like 
the science of how this all breaks down, and he knows a lot about the direction we need to move uh, towards sustainability. So we're not the experts. He certainly is. We're going to have him on in part two to talk about what we can do. Uh, and then after that, you know, we'll have us for part three. We're going to have the breakdown of opinions and where it goes. Exactly. You're going to get to hear what we think. And we may well be brutal or not brutal. We'll be honest. That's we'll wait what we'll till be. the expert gives us their breakdown and then we'll absolutely have us on. But until then, thank you so much for listening to this episode of It's a Start. Hopefully this helped you make sense of the madness out there. And hey, if you've done nothing else today, you've at least made a start. From both Angus and myself, we will speak to you all again soon. Bye. Bye-bye. Have a good one.